Okay, good evening, everyone. And welcome to our webinar. Um, we're hosting from Johannesburg, where it's probably a bit hotter than the average of you guys, and Glasgow, where it's probably a bit colder than the average of uh, you guys in the Northern Hemisphere. Although we do have a couple of South Africans on board, so uh, welcome, guys. So this is the first webinar leading up to the, the course next year. We normally do three or four, so we're in planning of other stuff as well. And if you, just before we get going, if you come in, if your video's on, just stick your video off. Um, okay. Yeah, or I'll try and do it for you as well. Um, and make sure you're on mute as well. And as we go through, I want to make it quite interactive. I've got a few questions up front, um, but if there's any questions you've got as we go through, just chuck them in. Um, the topic is integrative sports nutrition, and this is really just introducing the topic. And just a couple of strap lines we have on the website where health feeds performance, a big aspect for integrative sports nutrition is about health, whereas uh, a lot of other sports nutritions focus more on performance. But my belief is that you need health to fuel performance. And then another one I was just thinking about the other day, which I think is quite true. We're mostly practitioners that, that lecture on this course. There are a few academics, but it's mostly practitioner-based um, practical aspects of uh, sports nutrition with enough theory in there to back it up. It's evidence-based practice with a lot of uh, good theoretical stuff. So schedule for this evening is we'll do about 30 minutes intro um, and then we'll do about 15 minutes overview although these numbers generally uh, shift about a bit and then we'll open it up to q a but as i said before just um chuck in a question if if there's something relevant as we go so I'll just introduce myself and then someone can introduce herself. Um, I'm Ian Craig. I'm the founder of uh, the Center for Integrative Sports and Nutrition. My background's in exercise physiology. So in the, in, in the past, I was kind of part of BASES and I've rejoined BASES. Um, but then I retrained as a nutritional therapist and got into functional medicine, got really exciting. Um, after being a strength and conditioning specialist, I kind of left sport for a little bit and lectured in nutritional therapy, but then was asked over 10 years ago now to put on a course within nutritional therapy for sports. And that kind of, uh, you know, I guess spawned my um, passion back into sport. And I realized that we don't really have um, this connection between integrative type nutrition and standard sports nutrition. So that's that's kind of what I do now. Um, and I'm a practitioner in Johannesburg, um, working with uh, lots of interesting cases, challenging cases as well. Okay, over to you, Simone. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Simone Ducarmo, and I'm the course coordinator at the Center for Integrative Sports Nutrition. Uh, I study at Glasgow University, same as Ian did, but obviously many years later um, and I did an integrated master's so that meant I spent a year in South Africa at the Sports Science Institute doing just a year of basically research and then I came back to Glasgow to um, specialize in nutrition. I'm also the acquisitions editor for the Functional Sports Nutrition magazine so I work closely with Ian who's the editor of the magazine um, and I'm also a freelance sports nutritionist and personal trainer based at the Glasgow University gym. So the bulk of my clients tend to be regular gym users, but I also, I've also consulted with a range of different athletes from cross country runners to powerlifters and rugby players. The areas I'm really passionate about um, are plant-based nutrition, which is quite relevant nowadays. Um, the whole protein research sphere and more recently, sustainability within sports nutrition, which is still in its infancy. But I believe that if we can teach athletes to be a bit more mindful and really take into account sustainability, then this would have a 
downstream effect on greater society because people tend to view athletes as their idols. So that's just a bit, a bit about myself um, and I'll pass it back on to you, Ian. Thanks, Simone. Uh, something neither of us mentioned is we're both ex-athletes, so you know um, we, we like to kind of practice what we preach, or we certainly used to practice what we preach. Okay, right. I want to ask you guys if you've figured out how to use the messaging thing. Firstly, what is your profession? And I'll put them up both at the same time. Are you in nutrition? Are you in exercise? What kind of background do you have? And then secondly, what would you like to learn from this webinar? Okay, so I'm not going to wait because there is a bit of a delay between you guys writing and, uh, and appearing for me. Um, so I'll keep going, but please type them in. And as I go, I'll be kind of keeping a note on those and trying to taper or tailor this for you. Okay, so first slide really is sports and nutrition on one side, integrative nutrition on the other side. And why are they apart? Because it's kind of two different disciplines. It's kind of like you get medicine, standard medicine, and then you get functional medicine. They're different working systems, but we really need to be starting to join them together. Sports nutrition, uh, in my mind, is very quantitative. It's looking at the calories and the numbers and the carbs, your macros. It looks a little bit at the macros. It looks a little bit at phyto. Integrative nutrition, I'm going to go into that in a minute. Could call it functional nutrition as well. It was kind of a toss up between the, the two words when we built this course. But the goal is to, to bridge a gap between them. Any bridge, doesn't matter. That's a nice looking one. Okay, if I pause, I'm just letting people in. Okay, this is a, this is a slide I, I use a lot. The American College of Sports Medicine, when I was studying exercise physiology in America, this was you know very much gospel. They teamed up with the dietetic associations over there and came up with guidelines for uh, nutrient intake for athletes. And this is only part of it. I've taken part of the paper and just presented it. It's a very long paper. Um, but it's a, a representation that is very focused on your macros, the carbohydrates, the proteins, and the fats. Um, there is some mention of the, the micros, but it's focused more on like iron and there's a bit on antioxidants, but not too much more than that. And when I started presenting in this area, it was the 2000, year 2000 paper I was using as a comparison. Not too much has changed apart from the reference ranges I've got wider, which is probably because of recognition around individual needs without actually saying that because the carbohydrate range is really big there, whereas it used to be a lot more specific. The problem with the quantitative is you can lose the quality on the way. And this is a very simple slide that I use with lay people presentations. And I want you just to, you know, just think in your head, what's the commonality between these three kinds of food and these representations? So one medium sized apple, a big head of broccoli or two slices of white bread. So just have a ponder, what's the, what's the similarity between them? And the answer is if you've got the macro hat on, especially if you've got the low carb hat on, which has been a big, big thing in South Africa in recent years, these all have about 20 grams of carbohydrate in them. But to me, that kind of loses the point of what they are. What I see is an apple that contains good levels of pectin, which is nourishing to the gut membrane. I see a nice big head of broccoli, which is uh, full of glucosinolates, which are nourishing to liver detoxification function. The athletes actually need more than the average lay person. And I see two shitty slices of white bread that I would never stick in my own mouth because I'd be bloated like a, a goldfish. So exo exact opposite uh, function on the gut from say the apple. So we need to actually look at it and think about the quality and the function. 
Okay, I'm just going to have a little scan through um, what people do. So we get nutritional therapist, we get personal trainer. Um, we've got Monica here, who um, I know that's not it's not her background, which is great. But thank you for joining. Um, okay, Andrew, we get psychology, and you want to learn something you can apply to your own training and lifestyle. Um, learn how to apply the specifics of sports nutrition. Okay, so thank you. Um, and I'll weave those in. Psychology is a big part of what we do through more the interaction with clients. You can't be a practitioner, whether you're exercise or nutrition without being a psychologist. Okay, performance nutrition. In reverse order, this is what people tend to get wrong. So the novices, how much creatine do I need to grow my guns? Uh, how much sports strength do I need to outperform on the next marathon? The next layer is the performance nutrition. So this is kind of the layer that uh, international sports nutrition centers around. It's the calories, it's the macros, it's the ratios between, it's the nutrient timing, pre, during, post exercise type scenarios with regards to nutrition, which is absolutely vital. And when somebody comes in and, well, I had a client the other day, uh, I'm riding the 94.7, which is uh, Johannesburg, 100, roughly 100 kilometer cycle race. I love it because it's a break away from fatigue and gut and immune. And um, I can just focus on our, okay, what you're having the night before to eat, the breakfast, what you're having on the bike, the snack options, what your recovery is going to be. So that's performance, nutrition, and in a bit of a nutshell. Then you've got integrative nutrition for health, which I'll expand on in a minute. But it, it, the word is health here, and that underpins the performance. You can't have good performance without health. Something I think I missed, you know, missed the connection when I was an athlete. It's all about num the numbers. And then I added another layer recently, seasonal, organic, nature-made food, something that nourishes. Even if it's just carrots, change your carrots to something that has taste compared to something that's watery and you'll get more nutrients into your system. Okay, so my background is, um, as I say, exercise physiology, but more recently, nutritional therapy. I uh, just wanted to show a quick history of it. So the Institute of Optimum Nutrition started in 1984. That's quite a long time ago. And the last decade we've seen um, the magazine that I edit uh, come about. Um, we've seen this uh, Sports Nutrition Live conference, which became an ICANN conference. Um, we've had a few other things. Um, CNELM um, puts on personalized sports nutrition. So that was 2006. I got involved in that. Still lecture a little bit. But now here's a bigger offering to learn a little bit more on how to bring the integrative aspects of nutrition into sports. And something quite exciting has happened the last decade. And that was there was a research study on cyclists by a guy called Andy Beetroot, that's his Twitter handle. And he basically gave the cyclists a pint of pure beetroot juice per day for a week, and then checked their time to exhaustion in a time trial scenario on a bike. And he got a significant increased time to exhaustion. And then started looking at the details and beetroot contains a lot of nitrates, and nitrates are good for dilating uh, blood vessels. So the last year, so the last 10 years, we've had more of this stuff. And okay, well, beetroot, what about kale and spinach? And um, I do, or I've done a webinar, it's on our website, on functional or DIY sports drinks. And there was lots of different things. I was finding sugar beet and uh, cashew nut um, juice that can be created and pomegranate juice and lots of different options now. And I think that's exciting because we're starting to look beyond just the macros. This glass of beetroot juice probably has the same macros as you know your cheapest brand of sports drink you can find. But that is full of sweeteners, basic sugars, 
and lots of colors and preservatives that liver has to try and clear this you can see the color of it is full of antioxidants the antioxidants are nourishing to your um, circulatory system and your liver and your mitochondria and anything else that needs to be nourished to give you good energy okay so the functional model right so we're going into the functional um the institute for functional medicine here they've inspired a lot of growth and and uh you know let's say practitioners headspace and in medicine there's been incredible growth even down here in south africa which tends to be a wee bit behind in certain aspects functional medicine's a big growth area and genetics even okay so here's the institute for functional medicine spiders web and I won't spend time on this because a lot of your uh, nutrition practitioners anyway. These areas of the ball body all interact. And the analysis spider's web, the whole web collapses. So if you've got a weak link here, let's take gut because gut's the one I'm going to go on to in a minute. It's going to affect your immune system. It's going to affect your structural stability, your mind for sure. It's going to bump into your liver detoxification. It'll affect your hormones. And ultimately, all of these will affect your energy. Um, functional medicine looks very much at timeline so we've got antecedents triggers and mediators so the antecedents are anything in your timeline that has gone before what you have um, where you are now or where your athlete or client is right now so it's not good enough as a practitioner to just go into present day and just find out about that you need a timeline basis of okay so you're tired how long have you been tired? Let's go back a few years and, and get that build up. In some cases, it's relevant to go back to pregnancy of their mother. In many cases, not. Uh, be more kind of immune compromised situations. There might be some relevance there. Um, but you definitely need to get a, a history, a good history to properly understand the client. And I've had my own journey in terms of health. So I've experienced lots of different practitioners. And generally, the history is not sufficient. So this is quite a good setup. So this is, um, this is one of the many questionnaires that I've used. It's one of the more detailed ones. So thankful, thankfully for my clients, I, I didn't stick with this because it takes half an hour to fill it in. But it's an example of an athlete who was compromised. And I'll just highlight a few areas so the whole of his or her gap was compromised the adrenal function was compromised which you often find in athletes and not surprisingly the other area i'm highlighting here there's a few other bits and pieces including an immunity but central nervous system so it's off the topic today but um your communication systems your hormonal and your uh, so your endocrine and your uh, nervous system go hand in hand. And if you're exhausted, you're fatigued, you're overtrained, you'll bring down both systems or you'll throw them both out of balance. Okay, but not to just stick in nutrition. A good nutritional practitioner doesn't just do nutrition. So Simone and I, and some of the people who I have noticed on here tonight are in a fortunate position. They've got one foot in nutrition and one foot in exercise. And therefore you, you can see a bigger picture. So if you're not, so there's nutrition down there, but if you just do nutrition, you, well, what about their training? What about their recovery? What about their sleep? What about their stress levels? What about their toxicity levels? Is this something you can do to improve their oxygen transport? Fatigue, let's look specifically at that. Yes, nutrition will help it, but there might be some specific things that you need to go to nourish mitochondria, for example. And then we come to genetics. Well, on that last slide, what I was going to say, if, if you're purely a nutrition practitioner, one of the best things you can do is to listen to people who aren't nutrition practitioners, 
practitioners, either team up with a personal trainer, strength and conditioning sport, uh, coach or a sports scientist, or go to sem seminars, webinars with people who are talking about sport. So on our course, we have, um, we have a few um, scenarios where it's more of a sports science lecture rather than a nutrition lecture. Okay, so individuality, most of you will know about this book called Outliers. Um, N equals one, i.e. each person is a single entity and we are all certain outliers in one sense of another. But what is science doing, including sports science and nutritional science? We're trying to actually get to the, the average of the population. So if 20 people are studied, it's an N equals 20, and then therefore there's an average. So here's the example I often give in this scenario. This was a research study uh, about a decade ago, more than a decade ago, and it took a group of good cyclists and they did a 100 kilometer time trial. This was in Cape Town. 100 kilometer simulated time trial in two scenarios. One was a high carb for seven days and then do the time trial. One was a high fat for six days and then they did a carb load and then they did the time trial. And what you will notice is the, the, the line goes down from the high fat to the high carb in most scenarios, meaning that most people in a high carb scenario perform quicker because obviously the, the lower down is the smaller the, the time that they took. And the overall conclusion of the research study was that um, people um, perform better with a high carb scenario. But I went in and had a look around on the graphs and things like that, and I found this graph. And out of the eight people, there eight, were eight subjects, even if you're only counting seven. I, I missed a line somewhere when I was setting this up. But there were two going uphill. In other words, they performed better um, in a high fat scenario compared to a high carb. And then, you know, years later, there's been a big, big push in ketogenic approaches and high fat, low carb. And some people, it's like rocket fuel. Um, well, not rocket fuel, they just feel more stable energetically. And others, um, and I had a client today who just struggled because she did a very aggressive paleo diet I started to bring in a little bit of carbohydrates, such as some brown rice and some oats. And boy, her energy came from four out of 10 to seven out of 10 in four weeks. So, and I think that was just dietary changes because I hadn't done any supplements. She, her stress had stayed the same as well. So horses for courses. And then this is just a scatter plot that I set up because in science we know about scatter plots, so we should be using them and referring to them more often. So high fat diet, sorry, this is low carb, high fat up here. And then down at the other end, we've got high carb, low fat. You get some outliers that do really well on each extreme scenario, but where is the bulk of the population in the middle? So I, in the middle or left of middle or right of middle, I do genetic testing I have done for maybe eight years now. And the number of times I've seen the classic high fat, low carb, perfectly in a genetic sense, I think it's one or two in that time. So most of us need a more moderation approach, but there are certainly people that do well in the outliers. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through a gastrointestinal section just quickly as a demonstration and I'll hand over to uh, Simone to do our case study. So this was the Sports Nutrition Live conference in 2016 and we got do uh, Dr. Justin Roberts who has a background in nutritional therapy and he became an academic and then he started researching this stuff. So he was interested in gut health. So to the stress before and during exercise, these were his suggestions and then positive or interactive aspects of nutrients or supplements you can actually use, he listed there as well, okay? So 
there's a lot more to it than this slide. It's just a representation of one of the first presentations I ever saw of somebody actually researching thoroughly gastrointestinal health in a, in a thoroughly sports setting. But thankfully, it's, it's grown, grown, uh, gone from strength to strength. And this lady, Catherine Harris Harris, she's one of the lecturers on our course. She does, she sh shares the gastrointestinal uh, section with me. She did this um, article last year in Functional Sports Nutrition, Exercise Induced Gastrointestinal Dysfunction in Endurance Athletes. So here's Catherine here. She's an avid triathlete, looking worse for wear after a half Ironman. Um, so from personal experience, this was an interest and she, yeah, she did a tremendous thesis on this and then wrote, wrote up this shorter article. I personally suffer from gastrointestinal distress as a runner. And if you actually take the time to ask people, most actually do. Okay, so here's a little connection. Here's integrative thinking in action. So there's your gut brain. So the gut brain is well re recognized in that all the neurotransmitters that are in the brain are also centered around the gut. The gut is called the enteric nervous system because second to the brain, it's got the highest area of nervous concentration in the whole body. So there's a mirroring. It's not a mistake if you're feeling grumpy or bluesy if your gut's off kilter or anxious or, you know, you. Or if you're anxious that your gut's a bit runny, or if you're de depressed, your gut might be a bit constipated, or you know, there's many examples like that. Then here's a musculoskeletal inflammation. The gut is considered to be about, or host about 70% of the body's immune system. So if the gut is irritated, you can get a strong immune reaction which causes inflammation which can then have systemic effect especially if there's gastrointestinal permeability or leaky gut okay so you can manifest inflammation anywhere in the body this is just a sporting example but something i deal a lot with is autoimmune uh, diseases and i always go in deeply into gut health Okay, this is the immune system. So yeah, I think I've already covered that. Your gut can influence immunity very, very strongly. And tip, the immune system's kind of like a seesaw that should be fairly centered with two kids of equal weight, bounce up and down, but then it ultimately centers. But if the gut's inflamed, it can get overreactive at one side of the seesaw. And then there's our mitochondria. Where do we get energy if not from our food coming through our digestion and our assimilation and, and our absorption? That has to all come through the gut. And if the gut's inflamed and the immune system's taking load, that's a strong immune, sorry, a strong energetic um, sapper. And the liver's a strong energetic sapper as well. So if the gut's problematic, you're not gonna have as much available to the mitochondria. But also if you get inflammation there, there might be inflammation and oxidative stress at the mitochondrial uh, membrane level, which then causes dysfunction. And that's not just muscles, that's every organ in the body requires mitochondria. Okay, and then we get the four hour um, gastrointestinal program. So any nutritional therapist will know this. So I'll just run through it quickly. And you'll get the notes for this and uh, someone will share the recording for this as well. So don't worry if there's something that I go past too quickly. The fifth dimension is the gut brain axis. So I just literally wrote an article on the gut brain axis in sports. And I believe it's the fifth dimension because the first four R's um, are all based on the physicality of the gut. And that can get a certain amount of improvement, but if you still need more improvement, go to the head. I've had amazing results from meditation and yoga and working on not being so hard on, on, on themselves, you know, on my clients, um, because a lot of people are very, you know, 
push themselves hard and and that brings in the brain it uh, confines the brain a bit it confines our uh, ability to express and expand we to be good athletes we need to be expansive that's uh, a strong strong belief of mine okay i'm going to hand over to simone and uh, switch myself off okay guys um, i've got a really interesting case study to share with you um, i just noticed that louise tomlinson um, asked a question um, what is your position on the vegan athlete debate so I think this case study will really um, answer your question. So John, my client, he initially approached me because he had a lot of uh, GI issues, specifically bloating and um, just loose stools. And they tended to be training induced. So normally we'd go out, go out for a run, but he had to stop halfway um, because he needed to go to the toilet. So it was really impacting his performance. Next slide, Ian, please. So just a brief introduction uh, about John and looking into his diet and training. So he followed quite a strict vegan, low FODMAP and gluten-free approach. So very, very restrictive. And you'll see why in the next slide. His training, he was also doing quite a lot. He was doing 80 to 120 kilometers per week. And it was a mix of long distance sessions, high intensity track sessions. He incorporated um, his own core routine twice a week. For recovery, he would basically just do some light cycling and he did take one complete rest day per week. He was uh, 19 years old, so quite young. So he still had a lot to look forward to in his athletic career. And alongside training to be a competitive uh, cross country runner, he was also a full-time university student. And within the first five minutes of talking to John, I could immediately see that the, he had a typically, typical A-type personality. Um, so very perfectionist, very ambitious, very self-critical, uh, quite obsessive with his training and his nutritional routine, and was very highly self-disciplined. So looking into the next slide onto his, his timeline. So before conception, this is where we consider um, basically his family history. Um, so his mom and his, sis, uh, his sister both had IBS um, and his sister was diagnosed with IBS. She was taking medication for it. She was also diagnosed with anemia. Father was healthy. Brother was also very athletic but very prone to musculoskeletal injuries and both grandfathers had a history of bowel cancer. Uh, cancer. So again it just shows that there's a lot of predisposition in, in the gut. Pregnancy was a very healthy pregnancy. Um, birth was a vaginal birth and he was breastfed. And the reason why we ask these questions is because there's research that's shown that babies that are, um, that are um, bottle fed and C-sectioned tend to, they are at a greater risk of developing immune issues in later life. Um, but he did have a history of antibiotic use um, up until childhood. Uh, he had ear infections, toenail infections, and we know that antibiotics can um, really have an impact on the gut microbiota. Childhood, he was very happy, very active, um, and he had a healthy mixed diet growing up. Adolescence, again, very happy school life. And then this is when the problem started in June 2017. So he became vegan for ethical reasons, uh, animal welfare reasons. And then in September, 2017, he started university. And this is when he really noticed um, IBS-like symptoms when he started training uh, a bit more. Um, and he went to see his GP. GP gave him um, some medications, but it didn't help at all. And then in November, 2017, he had a really scary, um, went through a very scary period of time. He developed a blood infection um, and he had to go on antibiotic treatment. And then in December, 2017, he, he wasn't getting any better and he decided to contact his um, aunt, who's a doctor in Australia, and she recommended maybe experimenting with a low FODMAP diet to try and manage IBS um, symptoms. And he also just decided to take out gluten um, and then in May 2018, this is when he first initially saw me, 
he was still on that low FODMAP approach, which is quite concerning because we know that the low FODMAP approach should only really be followed for up to six weeks. So I was, I was quite concerned at the time. Um, and he, his symptoms were basically loose stools, lots of bloating, uh, low mood as well, uh, varying energy levels. And he was getting very, very worried. And this could have an exacerbating effect on his symptoms because he did have quite a, a strong gut brain access. And then he visual symptoms that I noticed is he was quite on the low end when it comes to weight. And he did, he did say he lost a bit of weight and expected with a restrictive diet. Um, and he also looked quite pale and not too vib not very vibrant. Um, so these three factors, the fact that he had low weight, um, the sudden change in diet and the eight type personality did make me think if he had any disordered eating, um, or an eating disorder. So I kept an eye on this and I did have an honest conversation with him about it, but he did say he, he was willing to try anything to, to, to get better. Um, and I, but I just, I kept an eye on it in case it was something that I had, that I had to refer basically to a, to a specialist. So on to the next slide, the, my initial recommend, oh, so first before that, we'll look at his typical plant-based diet. Um, so this was his diet when he, initially saw me and it's pretty good for someone who is vegan low FODMAP and gluten-free um, there were some fod, fod, high FODMAP foods that he could tolerate but it was most of them he couldn't um, and then from a macronutrient perspective and an energy perspective when I did the nutrition analysis using a specific software he was just slightly under his energy needs, but I wasn't too concerned about that. And the macronutrient distribution, distribution was fine. The only one I, I recommended that he increase slightly was his protein. He was getting roughly about 1.1 grams per kilogram body weight. And I suggested that he up that up to 1.5, 1.6, um, for the reason being that um, just to account for the lower digestibility of plant-based proteins. So onto my recommendations, initial ones. So he took a food first approach. He wasn't really keen on taking a lot of supplements. Um, and he was concerned that he might be anemic as well because his sister uh, was anemic and he was experiencing a lot of um, fatigue and his energy levels weren't the same. So we just, I did recommend some basic blood tests with his GP just to make sure. And then in the meantime, to incorporate some nutritional yeast and fortified plant-based milk for B12. I didn't do any functional testing at this point because firstly, coming from a conventional sports nutrition background, I wasn't fam too familiar with the functional tests at the time. Plus he didn't have the budget for it. Um, so we just focused on a basic blood tests and then since he didn't really notice any improvements with the low FODMAP approach and the gluten-free approach, I did, it, I did encourage him to slowly incorporate these into his diet and just keep a diary and make notes of the foods that he uh, incorporates to see if there's any negative reactions. We really, I really encouraged him to focus on foods for gut health. So stewed apples, so we know that stewed apples, it releases the pectin, really good for the gut uh, microbiota sauerkraut, kimchi, tempeh. So they're all fermented foods. They act as natural probiotics. Um, and so he's really keen to try these. I did recommend to substitute his post-exercise cornflakes um, with a smoothie to incorporate some glutamine. Um, and I'll explain why um, in, in a bit. And to also consider using kefir. Now, kefir is not vegan, but it has the benefit of being a fermented type of milk. Um, plus it would, it would support his protein levels. So he did consider kefir, um, even if it was just for a short time period to see if it would help with his gut health. And then when I did the nutrition analysis, the three micronutrients that um, were on the low end were omega-3, iodine, and vitamin D. Since he wasn't keen on taking any supplements, um, I, did, I did talk to him about a microalgae supplement for omega-3, but he he was keen to first do a food, food first approach. So I uh, recommended flax seeds, chia seeds and walnuts every day, and then some seaweed for iodine. So even some basic like nori sheets 
um, that we use for sushi, you could use them as a wrap or um, just sprinkle it over a salad or something. And then sub supplementation, um, I did talk to him about vitamin D, just because being a vegan, he's, he's more prone to be deficient in vitamin D, plus he lives in Scotland, so there's not much sunshine. Um, and then glutamine, because it's been shown to improve gut integrity in runners. So he was up for experimenting with that and incorporated it in the smoothie, and then a prebiotic and probiotic blend. And I made sure that all of these were informed sport approved um, because he was a competing athlete um, and could be subjected to drug testing. And then training and stress management techniques. So I did um, discuss with him about reducing his training load, especially running. Um, and it would require a conversation with his coach. But his coach was actually, he was actually already thinking about it because he could see that John was struggling. Um, and then just to substitute the running with some cycling and swimming, just because the running has a bouncing effect on the gut, and the cycling and swimming would be a bit more gentle. Um, and then for, for John specifically, he was the type of person that would feel a bit guilty if he just did nothing. So I did recommend um, to do something active, but that's restorative. But something like yoga and Pilates, and it has been shown that they do um, minimize any stress and anxiety, which could be, which could exacerbate any GI symptoms. So they actually really put the body into, um, actively into a, into a parasympathetic state. And then I did recommend to increase his resistance training, just to see if we can just build a bit more muscle mass, um, and keep it light just for the time being. And then mindful, a mindful pre-eating routine and the reason for this is to just to stimulate the gastric juices, um, make sure he's eating in a relaxed state and really chewing his food properly to make sure that he's absorbing the nutrients. Um, I did, in terms of supplementation, I also didn't recommend any digestive enzymes because there aren't any that are tested. So we had to really focus on the mindful pre-eating routine, see if we can get those gastric juices flowing. So after my initial recommendations, um, he really got on board with them and he did really well. He took quite a few months off uh, competitive running, but he wasn't hundred percent there yet. He was about a seven out of 10 and he wanted, he wanted to improve. But when I saw him, I noticed a massive change. He, he looked more vibrant. He had gained some healthy muscle mass as well. Um, so I was quite pleased, but we, we, we looked in a bit deeper. So in the next slide, Ian. So my follow-up interventions. So the fact that if you notice in the timeline, there were two red flags. So when he became a vegan and when he started university and developed those symptoms. And I think it was quite it's too much of a coincidence that the change in diet um, was so close to him developing the symptoms and the fact that he started university as well might be a stressful period. So I did talk to him about um, introducing certain animal-based foods and I had to really explain to him and show him evidence why it would benefit him. So, and I did also explain to him that you can still be ethical and eating animal-based foods. It really depends how you source the animal-based foods. So he's quite open to this. Um, and the main ones were kefir. So he, he did try the kefir, but I wanted him to be a bit more regular more consistent with his smoothies. Uh, a bone broth, because he wasn't keen on eating meat again, um, but he was open to experimenting with bone broth and putting it into his cooking um, for absorbable forms of collagen and key amino acids. Uh, so proline, um, glutamine as well, alanine, and then fish to support his omega-3 needs and eggs for choline, as well as protein, overall protein needs. And then, to support his training. So he kept on with the glutamine and he was taking the glutamine in his smoothies and that could be any time during the day. So we adjusted his glutamine timing. The first thing in the morning on an empty stomach so that the, so there's no competition from other amino acids. And then after his training sessions to support recovery. And then also any during any prolonged or high intensity sessions, I did recommend that he incorporated a DIY sports drink so that's basically a diluted juice um, with a pinch of salt. Um, 
And the reason for this, it's, it just maintains uh, glucose levels and it also moderates the cortisol response, which prevents any potential muscle protein breakdown and immunosuppression. With the supplements, uh, I reinforced the vitamin D, but then we also discussed potentially a multivitamin, just to make sure we're covering all the bases because he probably wasn't 100% there yet in terms of his gut health. We're not sure how effectively he's, he's, he's absorbing the nutrients. So a multivitamin would basically just cover all the bases. And he continued the glutamine, just adjusted the timing, and he continued the prebiotic and probiotic blend. And then finally, the training and stress management techniques. Um, I really reinforced the mindful eating practice. Um, I reinforced the yoga practice and he really got on board with the yoga. He even did a bit more mindfulness as well. Um, and then I also encouraged him since he was starting to um, increase his running again to really monitor his training load um, and recovery. Um, so I, I recommended an app and a subjective questionnaire. So having that objective and subjective um, tools really helps to give a a bigger picture in terms of his recovery. So after that, um, he did really well in, in, um, in his competitions. He did, however, just before the GB trials, cross country trials, he got a cold and he couldn't perform on the day. Um, but nowadays he's, he's basically symptom free. There's some days that he, he has to be a bit careful with his training, but, um, He's doing really well, and so really, really pleased with the results. So in the final message um, from this case study is, and I explained this to him, that you don't really, to follow a plant-based diet, you don't really need to be strictly vegan. And a lot of people think that they have to be strictly vegan, but especially if it's not appropriate for your individual body. And in his case, I believe that a strict vegan diet wasn't very appropriate for him. It can be plant-based by focusing on nutrient-dense plant-based foods while incorporating animal-based foods in a more mindful manner. So it's thinking about where you're sourcing your animal-based foods from. And second message, um, John's gut health improved through multifaceted approach of nutrition, training, and stress management strategies, which really shows how we as sports nutrition practitioners can do so much more with an integrated view rather than a performance-centric view. So it's not just about macros, um, it's more, there's more to nutrition and we can really focus on the stress, sleep, their overall lifestyle, their training, because it does have an impact on their different body systems. So that's me. If you want to read a bit more about um, the case study, there is an article on our website under resources articles and you'll find a really nice write up. Um, and just a really nice quote, um, it's from my colleague, Paul Aaron. He's actually on the, on the webinar at the moment. Um, and I really like this quote because it really, it really showcases, this, this case study really showcases um, this quote. So an athlete's health is the best ergogenic aid. Um, so yeah, that's me. So it's on to you, back on to you, Ian. Okay. Do you hear me okay? All right. Um, just to finish Simone's, uh, Simone's section, this is a really nice wrap up by the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Um, the field of sports nutrition is a dynamic one. The understanding of exercise, phys, psychology, integrative metabolism and biochemistry are integral to success. And that was year 2004. So a long time ago, I think Simone's case study showcases a very integrative approach. Uh, so she was looking at many different aspects and not just uh, the, the runner's nutrition, she was looking at psychology uh, and training. So yeah, well done someone, that was great. And as she said, you can, you can view that on our website, just go onto uh, the website and look under the resources and then the articles section. Okay, so, I'm going to come in and just tell you a wee bit about the course. The course is going to be running live next April, module one, June, module two, and September, module three. So that until um, 
until now has been the certificate course. Um, and well, that is still the certificate course, three modules, and I'll tell you more in a second. But we've also got a fourth module that's in November, and I'll tell you more about that as well. So that's brand new next year. We have, if you want to get little flavors of the type of content and uh, lecturing style on the course, this is just a screenshot from the video section on the website. This is video 15 out of 61. So there's plenty you can plow through their one to two minute videos. This is Dr. Hannah Moyer, who's our host at Kingston University. And she's presenting on interleukin six uh, responses and exercise. So this is the course so far. Um, we start off with integrative uh, nutrition for health and then into, that's module one. Module two is applied performance nutrition. So very much conventional sports nutrition as it is with the focus on calories, uh, body composition, macros, micros, but with a very integrative lens on the cap. And then the third module is very much the specialist one that changes every single year. So we've got the lineup set bar one lecturer now, so that, which I think is pretty good because it's almost a year ahead we're planning. Uh, that will be next September. Um, so you can go on the website and just see, see who's there. But we've also got this fourth module next year, and that's actually, I'm excited about all of these things, but um, I'm really excited about, about this one because it just brings the practicality of what we're talking about really into view, you know, into fully into view. Okay, so... We're a wee bit short in time, so I'm not going to like tell you much about this. I'll just flash through the modules. All of this is on the website, so you can read in detail. But module one, very much building the integrative model, looking at gastrointestinal health, bioenergetics, detox, endocrine system, musculoskeletal function. And every module has a case study, a live case study on the final day or a live consultation. Um, Module two, so yeah, as I say, more uh, quantitative type, type work that we're doing, but challenging the norm, challenging the, um, what's the right word? Not theory, paradigm. We're looking to shift paradigms. That's important. And then here's module three this year. So we get Big Paul, the grumpy old bodybuilder. He describes himself in the introduction. Uh, hypertrophy for performance and health and lifespan. Simone's helping him with the making weight and post-competition strategies. And then we've got a mix, uh, a mix of different uh, things in there. But keeping it very practitioner focused and practical to, to you guys to take away useful stuff. Module four, uh, this is my wife, Rachel, and she, she's always been into cooking, lucky me. Um, and she's also always been into sourcing. We've got a book called Wholesome Nutrition, and she wrote the section on sourcing, and she wrote the section on recipes. So that's her, that's her kind of focus, and um, she's very passionate about that. But a year ago, more than a year ago, she found a course in Colorado, that basically is natural cookery and all of the kind of descriptions in here, intuitive, creative cooking, energetic nutrition, that will come into her course. Uh, it's, and it's gonna be practical. She'll do live uh, demonstrations of uh, stuff that she's talking about, okay? Module four is not a necessary part of the, um, of the certificate course but you can tag it on for an additional, additional cost or you can just do the certificate course and then later on, you know, um, add it in because it interests you later. Okay, as part of the course, we have reading materials pre-module. We get pre and post-module webinars and Zoom meetings, so sort of more um, tutorials. Post-module assignments, including a case study. So they're all case study based, but especially module three, which is, it's just a case study that we give you. That's the only assignments. The other ones, it's a bit of a multiple choice and then a case study kind of based long, long answer. And we've got a closed Facebook group for discussion and study 
that everyone on the course gets access to. And, and yeah, there's some really good discussions about cases um, and anything that's not understood on the course that gets discussed on there as well. And we're, we're a small course. Um, it's basically Simone and I um, at the moment gradually building as, as the course gets bigger, but uh, you get instant access to tutors. We are your tutors and any lecturers we, we can connect with straight away as well. We've got endorsements. Uh, these are the endorsements that we've had for the two years running prior um, and they're in process. So it's, it's still quite early, but there's no reason why they, they wouldn't, wouldn't happen. But the certificate, the reason we can call it a cert certification or a certificate course is the Nutritional Therapy Education Commission. Okay, so that's the bigger, bigger thing. And then we get Banton Bases. Okay, finally, how much some of you might have been uh, watching the webinar to find out what the discount is that we've been telling you about. Okay, so the full price, this is advertised on the, on the website, uh, is 2,300 for the three, uh, three modules. Um, I forgot to add the fourth module in, but it's on the website, okay? Early bird is 2-1, so that's three months prior to the April start, or if you're doing online, it's a June start, so I, I should add that in as well. So it's a live course in London, takes about a month, a month to six weeks turnaround, then we have all the professionally edited material, which is then available for the online course. And then we've got a second online course from uh, October uh, next year as well, okay? There's discounts. If you're a member of any of the organizations that are given us uh, certification or accreditations, there's a big student discount. Uh, we're very much mindful that people coming out about to start studying a, a practitioner-based practical course can be quite useful. Ideally, final year students or postgrad students. And we've got a 12 month payment plan. If you say, oh, can't afford two grand, uh, can I space it out? Yes, you can. Okay, but finally, what is the price for the first 10 registrants? That's 1750. Okay, so a decent discount just to get things moving. Um, and basically to uh, help cash flow for the, the course. If we have 10 early registrants, it improves cash flow uh, for the course uh, next year. So give us a shout. What you need to do to apply for this is email myself or someone. Uh, the details will come up in a sec. Just say that you'd like to register. Um, all that I ask is a 10% uh, deposit by the end of this year, um, sorry, a 10% 10, 10 deposit to hold that place and then pay the, the remainder by the end of the year. Or you can do the 12 month payment on this as well. So, you know, just make the first payment to hold the place. All right. This is all the details. So, intsportsnutrition.com is the website. Um, put Ian in front of that, you'll get me. Put Simone in front of that, you'll get Simone. Okay, so that's quite easy. And please interact with us on Twitter because that's important nowadays. Simone enjoys it. I, I cannot do it out of necessity, but uh, yeah, well, one day I'll enjoy it. Okay, so question time. Um, we, had, um, we had Louise's question about the vegan athlete. Um, just Louise, if you can pop us a, a message just to say if uh, someone answered that okay for you. Uh, I've got a couple of questions that have been sent before. Um, okay, how much of the course is practical applications of integrative sports nutrition and are there real life case studies presented? Um, the answer is yes. Um, it's as practical as possible. We need the course to be evidence-based practice that's what's required through pretty much any organization nowadays. So to get the CPDs, there's a lot of science that comes through the presentations. But ultimately, the way I present, the way Simone presents, the way the majority of the lecturers present is, okay, well, there's the science, and here's what I do in practice. 
So we respect what's out there, but we also respect, the, uh, respect what we don't know. And we also respect um, that we're learning all the time. I won't tell you how long I've been in practice, but every, every day I'm learning something from a client. And that's what we should do. Okay, Louise says yes, thank you, good. Um, the other question from Helen, are there essays and assignments to be done during the course? So I've hopefully answered that. Um, yes, um, each module one and module two has a formative assignment, which is just, it's kind of a self-assessment to practice. And then it's got a summative. Module three is just one big real case study. So module one and two has got a case study, but it can be fictional. Module three, um, it's a real case study. So you actually have to have a client. If you're not in practice yet, then it's a case of uh, asking a friend and telling them that it's a practice session. Okay, so they can't sue you or anything like that. Okay. I've somehow managed to switch Surrey on in my phone, so I apologize for that little tweet in the background there. Um, I never even use it anyway. Okay, any other questions? Um, Adam. Adam says, do you cover some case studies that include elite amateurs who have big work commitments and family commitments, finding that they can be tricky? Simone, do you want to answer that so they don't hear it all from me? Yes, that tends to be um, when we're doing the live consultations, we always get an tends to be amateur athletes that do competitions, but then they also have a lot of big work commitments, family commitments. So, yes, and there's a lot of practical, a lot of practical um, debates um, and discussions in those in those live case studies. Um, I also. Most of the presentations I do, I'll bring in a, a case study at the end just to kind of demonstrate some of the stuff I've said. And the majority of the clients I have are exactly that. Uh, keen amateurs, some, some of them elite uh, amateurs, but mostly, yeah, with lots of different commitments and that's why they're having so much problems. So uh, overtraining, adrenals, endocrine dysfunction, immune dysfunction are common parts of that as well. Um, Louise, do you offer the wholesome cooking module as a standalone course? Um, brilliant. Thanks for asking that because I totally forgot to, to mention it. Yes, we are planning to do it as a standalone. So you'll see it on the, you'll see it on the website. Um, module three can be taken as a standalone as long as you have the requisite background. Uh, so you can, you can always treat that as an oversized um, conference. Module four, the cookery, yes, that can be a standalone as well. That will be more of a standalone, but it can also be a tag on to the course. Okay, any other questions? Anything you want to, uh, anything else you want to share, Simone, that we haven't mentioned? No, maybe just to give an example of one of the amateur athletes, well, elite amateur athletes that we had last year, it was quite an interesting case. Um, he was a 60, was a six year old um, triathlete. He was the first in the UK. So, and that was very interesting. Um, he was I mean, a tough we do, one. We do, we do tend to follow up with them as well. So we don't just have the one consultation. We also follow up with them um, as a group um, using Zoom and doing online follow ups with them to see how they got on with the groups, the whole class's recommendations. Yeah, and we keep it interactive. Um, yeah. So we've got Pete Williams, who's a good friend and colleague of mine for the first one. Um, I'll do the second one. And then we've got a sports dietitian, Rick Miller, who does a lot of disability sports for the third one. So yeah, we could maybe get him to bring in a disabled athlete. But basically for each one, we generally put our Facebook and Twitter messages to recruit um, participants for that so they're not they're not current clients so they're they're brand new and yeah you get to see okay how how I would work in practice seeing somebody for the first time how Pete would work you know how Rick would work and each year that will change as well we'll we'll bring other people in okay any last questions before we finish 
We've only gone seven minutes over, so it's, it's not too bad, not bad. for me. <laughs> okay, so any questions, any interest in the course, you've got our um, emails, ian at intsportsnutrition.com or simone at intsportsnutrition.com. And we look forward to interacting more with all of you in the coming months. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys.